There are two good reasons for reassembly. One is as a form of therapy, to exercise a part of the brain that may otherwise remain dormant, and to use hand tools, which were the first things to empower us as a human species. The other reason is to test the popular notion that the past was somehow wonderful. I mean, it certainly looks good because we look at it through rose-tinted spectacles, but what did it sound like? Well, when I finished reassembling the 195 parts of this portable record player, we will know. And we're going to start with the arm, which is over here. We will require this mysterious bracket, that bit, which looks very familiar, some wire, a spring, oh God, some things, another spring, alert, a pin and the usual smattering of screws, roll pins, washers and what have you. Here we go. Now this particular Dan set is the Bermuda and is described here on the leaflet as a record reproducer. How posh is that? And what's really interesting is it's from 1963, which is the year of my birth. So on this bench, we have three arms from 1963, mine and this one. And unusually, we actually have an exploded diagram, which is a rare luxury on the rear assembler. So, cripes, part number 10, bring height adjuster plate. Well, that's wrong for a start, because 10 is some sort of grub screw. What do they think 11 is? Tone arm, height adjuster plate. Rubbish. Oh. Well, never mind, I know what the arm looks like. I've got one on my record player. I still own my records, I still occasionally play them, but it's a right bore because you put a record on and you sit down on the beanbag and make yourself comfortable and then it's finished. You have to get up and put another one on. And apart from anything else, you spend so much time ministering to the mechanisms of your automatic record player that there was no chance of getting up to any hanky-panky or whatever it is your mum and dad were worried about. This was probably the most effective contraceptive of the 1960s. Unless you could manage it in the three and a half minutes of a song. Mind you, as a teenager, that was an eternity, wasn't it? So. No, but the thing is, records, records are a fantastically fond memory because I would run home from school or run to the record shop with my birthday money, my £1.99 or whatever, and buy a record. And that was incredibly exciting and they were wonderful things, but that's because I was 14 years old. Everything is exciting when you're 14 years old. And ice cream is, you know, meeting a girl, it's just all deliriously thrilling. Well, maybe it's still it. We'll find out in a minute. Anyway, I've done a bit. I've put that in. And that is the tone arm height adjustment plate. The tone arm will hold a stylus, yes. the point of contact between the recorded music and its electromagnetic reproduction, all of which represented a quantum leap in the consumption of popular music. The great development when I was young was the, the cassette player, because you could buy a blank cassette, say a C90, 90 minutes, and then you could record your records and all your mates' records and you could make a party mix, which was a godsend. But it, you couldn't do that like a download. You couldn't sit there and take 10 seconds to download a song. You had to do it in real time with your fingers on the buttons of the tape recorder and the records. You had to listen. You had to have the party by yourself before you could then have it again with your mates. And it was technically illegal. You know, people used to say home taping is killing music, but it didn't seem to be, as far as we were concerned, it seemed to be spreading it like wildfire because we could all listen to it. Only one person had to actually buy the record. Everybody else could just steal it. It was brilliant. Right, so that clamp holds the pin. The pin is already through the slot. That pivots very smoothly. That's nice. You simply clip that in wherever on the spring you think is relevant. That's that. That's the arm. It's definitely a bit of a record player, isn't it? Tremendous. Now I think, having studied the diagram, that everything else I'm going to do will have to take place either side of the chassis, which is the big plate here. I want to mount the arm on this bit, which I'm going to call the tower. It's 
got a nice component. Um, I do need this complicated, riveted together little assembly. You can only take the portable record player as far as the extension lead would allow you, I suppose. But the great thing about it was that the early, sort of my grandmother's era, record players or gramophones as they were usually called, were pieces of furniture. They were, they were like sideboards and they tended to be in an important place in the home, such as the sitting room. And if you wanted to listen to a record, you had to sit there while your dad smoked a pipe and your mum did a tapestry or whatever. And that was just not very conducive to teenage revolution. You had to wait for your parents to go out. But once they made a portable record player, that means you could go and hide in your bedroom with it or in the loft or the garage. You could carry it around to your mate's house. Before you knew it, you had punk rock, cars were on fire in Paris and all the rest of it. It was fantastic. So I'm going to attach the housing for the mechanism that detects which size of record is about to play. History generally records that the teenager was a bit of a 60s invention. It didn't really exist until then. People went to school and at the age of 14, they instantly turned into their parents. And things like transistor radios, portable record players, they were the beginnings of music on the move, I suppose. They're what led ultimately to things like, you know, smartphones with MP3 files, iPods, and all the rest of it, via the CD player, the portable CD player, the Walkman cassette player, they all made music more and more accessible in more and more places and available ultimately on the move. So, yes, I suppose this could be seen as something of a revolutionary artifact. What I'm beginning to find quite remarkable about this is that, save for the electric motor and a few little bits in the speaker, which are electric, obviously. This is an entirely mechanical device, and yet quite a sophisticated and clever one. Like that, oh, look at that. Springs. Before the record player, there were things like the phonograph, which was a cylinder record player, Thomas Edison and some other bloke. Um, and prior to that, it was live. You had to either learn to play an instrument or you had to go to places where bands and minstrels and um, the London Underground, for example. That's why recorded music was such a marvellous thing. I mean, back in the day, this was an expensive piece of kit. I think in, in today's money, it would cost about the same as a, as a really good smartphone, which I suppose is appropriate, except, of course, this only played up to eight records. It didn't do any of those other things. So it was expensive, but actually things, despite what a lot of people tell you, things were expensive in the olden days. It's one of the reasons things had to be made repairable. It wasn't a moral thing. Things had to last because they were too expensive to replace. Because things had to last, in some ways, that arrested progress because there was less incentive to improve them. So although your smartphone might only last for you know, a year and a half before you've sat on it and snapped it in half or dropped it down the bog or whatever, that actually isn't such a bad thing because the next one you get will be much better. I'm one hour and 50 minutes into my reassembly. I've done the tone arm and attached the housing for the record size selector. Time for some more bits. Anyway, the speed control knob, we've got all sorts of interesting things to say about that. Here's the mechanism from underneath, the little lever, Screws, clips, and then this clever bit, which allows the machine to know what size record you've just put on it mechanically, and that is a little finisher bit for the top of the turret. Being from 1963, which was an excellent year, this record player is not only it's not only contemporaneous with me and my birth, it's also from the same year as the launch of the cassette tape. And the cassette tape, if I remember correctly, was originally devised as a means of improving dictation machines because the bigger tape would have been much clearer than those tiny little ones that they use. But Da Kids got hold of the technology and decided, well, that's no good, it's much better for ripping off my mate's record collections. But that's often the way. You need the, sort of the imagination of youth to see the true potential of these things. And the other thing we're going to do in this part of the process 
is fit and speed control, which has 16, 33, 45, and 78. Now, the, the first popular records were 78s. That's what your, well, my grandparents would have had, your great-grandparents possibly. And they lasted for, I think, about sort of two and a half, three minutes. And in fact, the automatic record dropping system was first devised for 78s because if you had something like the movement of a Beethoven symphony, obviously it wouldn't fit on one seventy-eight. You had to have a number of them dropping down in succession. You still get gaps in the music, but you didn't actually have to do the stuff. Um, the 45, which I, th I think the first one was Bill Haley and the Comets. That was the first uh, vinyl 45 and they lasted for sort of typically two and a half to three and a half minutes, depending on how they were cut. And the 45 sort of rose and, and decayed in popularity. That was a stupid word, wasn't it? I don't, what, what's the word I mean? Rose and diminished in popularity during the time that a record player like this was available. Um, the 45 very quickly gave way to the album, because the album you would get lots of songs on, the 33 and a third RPM record, which could be a good 20 minutes per side. The downside of all that is that the album length record could be used for a series of great songs, such as the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds, but it did give rise to the horrors of the concept album. So you could end up with something like King Crimson's Lizard, which just had one long song all the way across one side, rambling on about pixies and goblins and Prince Rupert and all that hippie nonsense. So. Isn't it interesting that vinyl is actually a very long-lived format uh, because CDs have come and gone whilst we still have vinyl with us. In fact, vinyl sales are increasing again now because people like it for nostalgic reasons, because it gives warm sound, you can do scratching with it and so on. Unfortunately, the 33 and a third RPM LP also gave rise to the concept album. So you'd get things like King Crimson's Lizard and Genesis, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. You get stuff or Supper's Ready and you know, all that stuff that goes on for a whole side. And it's just complete drivel. A lot of old hippie nonsense about goblins and Prince Rupert and God. Anyway, this drops in here. Here's that little spring pass there. Then we'll have a look at what's going on underneath. By the way, a bit of confusion, if you've been watching this very carefully. I said this was a Danset Bermuda, which it is. The deck part of it, the turntable bit, says Monarch on it. That's because this was made by BSR, Birmingham Sound Reproducers, which is why they call it a record reproducer on there. This bit was brought in from then to the Danset factory and fitted in Danset's case and electrics and so on. So it's a Danset unit with a Monarch turntable in it. The Danset bit was based in London. This bit, the mechanical bit, was made in Birmingham. Same as Richard Hammond, except hopefully this will function properly at the end of it. So to have a, let's see what's going on underneath there. That's the other end of the bit we've just dropped in. This plate is connected through that pin to the arm. So the arm can go in three different positions, there, there, and there. And where that goes to, is dictated by what hits that on the way down. That's the little thing that the record hits. You imagine you've got a record that big or that big or that big. As it goes down, it clouts that and how much it clouts it and how far tells the mechanism underneath what size the record is and where to put the needle. It's brilliant, really. Now, speed control. The speed of record, 16, 33, 45, 78. A pleasure that we had as children that you young people don't have with MP3 players is you can't play music at the wrong speed, and we could. We could put anything that was supposed to be on a 45 on 78, and any song in the charts could be performed by Pinky and Perky. You can play them backwards and forwards, which is what scratching is. See, another abuse of a format leading to an art form. It's good, isn't it? This is the Dan Set Bermuda. Quite an exotic name for the 60s. Prior to this, in the 50s, they made things like the major and the minor and the auto, the auto change or something like that. And then they decided to call, call one the Bermuda because people's horizons were broadening because the people of Britain just became more worldly. Oh yeah, look, I didn't put that on. That, I'm, to I'm told this is very easy to break, so. Isn't that nice? 1960s beige. 
Yeah, the 60s and the 70s especially, brown. Brown became very popular for kitchen units, cars, clothes. I, don't, I think maybe as a sort of natural break on our optimism, because a lot of things seemed to be good in the 70s. We thought, oh, everything's becoming very modern and very funky, but actually it wasn't, because none of it worked and the lights kept going out. So it was probably a government initiative to stop us getting too carried away with the idea that everything was brilliant. It's not bad, but just so you don't, you know, build your hopes up too high, it's available in the following range of colours. Brown. That's well diddy, that screw. Magic screwdriver. Have you noticed how I've got a box full of screwdrivers that I'm very attached to and, and I'm very keen to talk about them. I actually use three. It's not true, actually, I use four. Now, I'm going to show you how this works in a minute. I just I want to make sure it's together, otherwise it'll all fall apart in my hands. Speed control. You move the lever. Oh, that's a nice noise. Love it. Used all the bits up as well. Let's do... Um, oh, hang on, there are some, there's some unfinished mechanical business on the bottom, I believe. So I think we'll get all those bits and I don't think we need to put that bit in yet, but let's go and have a look at the components. Plastic pot. That. I need that with its little spring. These four bits, which retain that and stop it flopping about. And then the other end of the mechanism is that lever. Hang on, let me just think about this for a minute because I'm finding it, there's something slightly unconvincing about this arrangement. So that would go on there. That would also go on there. I, may you muff it. it, goes in there. God above. Right, that's better. Now that can go on there and there. And that end, I'm guessing, must have to locate in there. Nothing much appears to have happened from there, but from there, look, there's all sorts of things going on. That's, that's most exciting. Stubby screw. Oh, that's very nice, the way that goes in there. So that's all that mechanism held in place, the reject mechanism, the speed controller, the bit that tells you what size record it is, the bit that tells you where the needle has to go to, which is dependent on what size record it is. That's incredibly clever. In some ways, that's more impressive than it being done electronically, because it has to actually physically do it. That's mechanical intelligence you've got there. I like it. I like contemplating it. It's a shame you never see all this when the thing's working. I should have made this transparent, but a mirror in the bottom of the box so you could see the mechanism. Anyway, it's not quite finished, inevitably. We've still got to put this plate on and this big spring and a few other rods and sods. Then we can start thinking about powering. We can start thinking about the motor. And that means soldering. So this next plate that goes on controls uh, the return of the arm with the stylus in. Some of it goes on from underneath, which is this bit that I'm picking up, the plate, the spring, and the usual little odds and sods. The other bit of it, the interesting bit, it's all interesting, the really interesting bit, which is the cam plate, that goes on the other side of the chassis when we turn it over. Now, I've got to be honest, the exact function of this is slightly unclear from the diagram. I'm going to say the spring goes from there right back on itself to there. Yes. That's clear of those levers, so that works. And then remember to put the little spring clip on the other end. I suppose the arrival of the Dan set was very timely, given that music was becoming, well, it was beginning the process of becoming a bit revolutionary. I don't mean in the way of 
Chopin's revolutionary etude. I mean, it was all about descent, teenage descent, which is a great thing and a very powerful thing. It meant you could go away and listen to things in secret, which meant you could put possibly slightly more salacious stuff in records because you weren't sitting next to your pipe smoking grandpa listening to it. Having said that, this is all slightly before my time, but thinking back to records I know of that came out in that sort of 19, early 60s period, like the early Beatles and so on, I can't think that there was anything in there that gave cause for alarm. Not like the Sex Pistols or Eminem or so on. I mean, well, love me do. It's the sort of thing my mum would say. From me to you. It was, all, it was all very chaste, actually, I think. It was about people falling in love forever. But what you crave when you're 15 or whatever, you want to be left alone, don't you? You want to have your own room, your own den, or you want to be somewhere just with your mates. You don't want your mum and dad there, you don't want teachers there, you don't want policemen, guardians, vicars, priests, anybody who tells you how to live your life. So I suppose this was a form of independence, wasn't it? A bit like getting a bicycle or a, or a car or something. That wasn't a particularly profound thought, I'm afraid. Now we have a bit of a choice here. We can continue by installing the motor or we can break on through to the other side and finish off a few bits of the mechanism which live above the plate. I think the mechanism. Let's do that. Let's get all the mechanism right and then we'll think about power and then we'll think about sound. To finish the mechanism, I'll need the cam and these bearings which allow the turntable to rotate smoothly. We're at a point in the assembly that requires lubrication, so grease is the word. Here it is. It's a small amount, a small packet of very special record player grease. You have a bit on there, which is the pivot for the, the elaborate cam plate. But I need a bit more grease for the main bearing. This is an extremely important bit. This is where the turntable spins. If it doesn't spin freely, obviously your music will come out in a very wonky fashion. And this rather delightful ball bearing cage. Right, that's the bearing on. Now the cam plate. So let's go... There it is in the groove. Oh, it's all beginning to sound like a clunky old record player. That's good. You see, as I move... All sorts of amazing things going on. Let us go to the table of componentry and find the motor. So as well as the actual motor itself, which is this big bit here, we need the rubber mounts, which isolate it from the rest of the chassis, clips and washers to hold it in place. These screws nuts, small washers, all put the switch together and hold the cable in place on the chassis, I think. When I woke up this morning in the morning light, I put on my blue jeans and I had a slight sense of dread about putting this record player together because I thought it would be an awful thing, but actually it turns out to be strangely pleasing as a mechanical artefact. It's made out of actually very basic to be honest, quite cheap materials. It's just bits of pressed steel, a few, I think that's some sort of zinc alloy die casting that's made out of the same stuff as, you know, toy cars. But it's actually, it's a hopeful sort of thing. It smacks of optimism and youth and joy. Okay, that's the motor in place, as simple as that. Th this looks incredibly complicated. And conceptually, it is complicated. I don't know how they would have designed it. They must have started with the idea of a turntable, I suppose, and then worked backwards from that, thinking, how do we make it drop another record down? How does the needle know where to go back to? And so on and so on. But actually, it's in terms of assembly, although there's lots of it, I and mean, it is a bit baffling, 
it will actually only go together the way it's meant to go together. If you put something in the wrong hole, you'd know about it pretty soon afterwards because there'd be something else that obviously was meant to go in that hole. So even without the help of the diagram, which isn't actually that helpful anyway, I think you would eventually be able to do this. Yep, that has nipped up. Are record players romantic? There's something about discs in sleeves, it's all to do with, I don't know, seduction or... I don't know. I don't know what it is about record players, but there is something about them that you don't feel about washing machines, for example, from the 1960s, or old fridges, or old cars. I mean, the old cars just leave me cold, really. They're, they're interesting artefacts, but as things to use, they're awful. So, there should be a washer first, obviously, otherwise that's directly on top of the rubber, which would be very bad practice. One of the most infuriating experiences in the workshop or garage is to have something, I mean, to be honest, in my case, it's usually a motorcycle or a bicycle, that you've bought off someone else and you do a service on it or a bit of a checkup and you find something that's been bodged. I once had a a motorcycle that I bought of somebody and I rode it through town and I thought, this is great, it works really well. And then the headlamp started smoking really aggressively. And then to be brutally honest, it caught fire. And the reason was a short had occurred inside the headlamp between some of the wiring. A lot, a lot of the wiring in a motorcycle is behind the headlight. There was a short between a piece of frayed wiring and the case of the headlight, which would normally blow the fuse. When I eventually got the smoldering bits home, I discovered that the previous owner had obviously blown the fuse at some point and replaced it with just a piece of steel wire, which didn't fuse. So the circuit didn't break and the whole thing just melted. I had to rebuild the entire loom of the motorcycle because somebody couldn't be bothered to spend 25 pence on a fuse. That sort of thing annoys me. After five hours and 38 minutes, or just about enough time to listen to Yes's Tales from Topographic Oceans, as well as the tone arm and ejector knob, I've reassembled the speed control knob, the selector arm, the cam and bearings, and the motor. Now I can finally attach the arm to the chassis. I have to go down into the bowels of the machine. Through there. And finally, got reattach the spring. That eventually comes to rest on there. And if we put that on, we can actually clip it to there, which keeps it safe. Then, let's not worry about the, the wires for the motor for a moment, and let's look at the tag strip, and let's accept, shall we, between us, that it's time to do some soldering. I've got a bit of solder on the bit, and there you go. That's, that's not bad, but it's not the purest way of doing it. The purest way is to hold the iron and the wire onto the tag, and then, apply a blob of solder so that it flows around it nicely. But the problem with that, obviously, is that you need three arms. And that's something you'll hear people saying about soldering all the time. To do it properly, you need three arms. Beautiful. I think that deserves a swig of tea. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going back to the table. Two self-tappers. And we need the grill itself and the baffle plate, backing plate thingy, and the cabinet of the beast. All I have to do now is attach a few wood screws and it'll start to look like a 1963 downset Bermuda. So by the 70s, people were putting wood on the outside of hi-fi units to make them look posh again, not realising that they were originally made of wood, and then people banished wood to the inside of hi-fi. 
obviously in Thatcher's Britain, everything had to look woody because we all wanted to pretend we were part of the aristocracy. Look, there is its face. And I've got to be honest, having not seen that for a long time, I was instantly transported back to a world of the electric light orchestra. And I wish it hadn't happened. So I'm going to walk back over to the table of componentry and I'm going to bring over the pre-assembled amplifier and speaker. So stand by. Now some more screws, all of those, four countersunk, four pan head types. And the mercifully pre-assembled, because that's how it came, amplifier and speaker bundle. There is a valve as well, I'm not taking that because that's just asking to get broken. God, what a shocking mess, what is all this stuff? So now inside the box, we've got all the really untidy, messy electrical stuff. There's the amplifier, there's the pots for the little control panel at the front, the speaker. Um, I didn't solder it all together because the crew refused to tolerate that. I could do it, but you wouldn't be able to see it, so what would be the point? And anyway, that's pretty much how it would have come at the time. That would have arrived at a, as a, a pre-assembled unit. It would be easy to assume that all this electrical stuff is the brains of the Dan set, but actually I don't think they are. This is fairly simple electronics. I think the brain of the Dan set is a mechanical brain. It's all that stuff going on underneath the chassis, underneath the turntable. That's where it's in impressive, I think. This stuff in here, this is just electrics rubbish. That's the speaker in, and I can still remember LP records. I mean, they were old records when I was a kid, so they were probably records that belonged to my mum and dad, but people were so excited about the idea of stereophonic sound that you'd have a record with somebody quite, quite big, quite well known on it, like the Berlin Philharmonica with Herbert von Karajan, but the biggest word on the cover was stereo. Herbert von Karajan plays Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Stereo! Um, we're getting quite close here. This is really quite exciting. There are some screws to hold this plate down into the cabinet, and then we will actually attach the chassis. So let's get um, the knobs, these screws, Yes, that's it. It's a screw run. So there are some very significant bits going to go on here. That's just a circlip. These are the transit screws and clips. Those hold the record deck steady while you're walking along with it as a handbag and then release it so that it sits nicely on its suspension springs. That's the arm that goes over the top of the records when they're sitting on the spike. That is the spike itself. That is a, I don't know what that is, but I'm sure we'll work it out. That is the turntable. That's a really exciting bit. Then over here, as promised, two knobs and the screw I forgot last time for the cable clamp. Two knobs. There's a little flat on the shaft. There's a little flat inside the knob and it should just push on. It does. Yeah, the flat on that one is at the bottom. There's the flat. There you go. Oh, what a nice click. That's the sound of old hi-fi. Good, okay, that's us done for the moment with the, uh, the case. Better keep the exploded diagram just in case. Like that. Oh. Bring this back in. I'm torn. What do I want to put on first? I think I want, uh, yeah, yeah, control arm. No, turntable. What the hell? Let's put the turntable on. So I need the big circlip. The turntable, this is quite an important moment, I suppose. It's not a record player, really, until we've got this on. That 
will slide over there and engage with the teeth on the cam wheel. That's become a record player now. I mean, all a record player really is, is something going round and round. But there's a lot of extra stuff to turn it into an automatic record player. A straightforward record player that simply played a record you could pretty much make yourself if you had some means of power, even if it was only a treadle. You could make the record go round and round. And if you had a sharp, pointy bit of metal and a paper cone to make a crude amplifier, you could work out what was on a record. I mean, if you think about the first records, the very first records were really the opposite of the process by which a record is played. That is, when the record is played, the groove sets up a vibration in the needle, in the very tip of the needle, which is amplified electronically and then comes out of a speaker, or originally came acoustically out of a speaker, like on an old wind-up 78 gramophone. But the original records were made the other way around. The sound went into a big trumpet, and the needle vibrated and cut the groove. So the groove was the literal impression of the air on the surface of the record. It was the vibrations of the air, which is all that sound is, made visible. If you looked at them under a powerful magnifying glass, you'd have said, that's what Beethoven's Fifth Symphony looks like. And you'd be looking at sound. That's quite an interesting thought, isn't it? This is clever. I, th this used to fascinate me when I was a kid. Record sits on there. Machine knows when it's time for the record to drop down. But it only drops one record down, doesn't it? How does it know? I do have a dim memory of occasionally no record coming down and occasionally two dropping down, which meant that if you were lucky, you could entirely miss Mr. Blue Sky. I've been reassembling this record player for 7 hours and 23 minutes. I've assembled the chassis and cabinet and installed the amplifier and speaker. I've got a bit more soldering to do, then it'll be a bona fide tool of teenage rebellion. Is there anything else I need to do inside there? Yes, there is. Of course there is. How foolish of me. We need to put the single valve into the amplifier. This is... Now, we're going to instigate a long discussion by any hi-fi enthusiasts watching about whether valves are actually give a warmer sound than uh, modern electronics. Maybe they do, I don't know. They are very fragile and they are enormous. Now this thing that looks a bit like Skylab is a valve and it does the job that would soon be done by transistors, the small components that did so much to make radios smaller. And those are enormous by modern standards because that job is now done by a microscopic speck on a, on a circuit board in a chip. And I seem to remember somebody very old saying that you should never really touch these with your fingers because the grease from your fingers can cause a hot spot to develop on the glass, which can cause them to fail. So just in case that is true, I should polish it up and hold it with a piece of paper. It will only go in one way because of the arrangement of the pins on the end. And then there is this little springy clip it goes over the end to hold it in place. Now, had I broken that, doing that, which is very easy to do because it's only made of glass, uh, the program would have been over. Electricity is dull and it doesn't really exist, remember. We've been into this. You just have to believe it and it will work. It's like Indiana Jones stepping out onto that bridge that isn't there in The Last Crusade. He has to believe it's there and it is. If he'd been a doubter, it wouldn't have been there. Oh, God, that takes me back. That was your iPod, your MP3 player. If you were a youth in the 50s and 60s. This is a bit like that telephone we looked at in the first series. The way it works the functionality of it becomes more and more irrelevant because old technology does, it's just surpassed. But the way it looks remains important because it's part of the history of art and design, which we think is important. The way things look always matters. 
That is why art shall ultimately triumph. It has no utility, therefore it doesn't actually have to work in any way. Right, this is an extremely high quality French flick screwdriver. Righty tighty. Ladies, if you're watching this thinking, hmm, my husband stroke boyfriend would probably like one of those for Christmas, you're right, he would. Oh, do we like that? Feels to me like it's time to put the lid on. The lid. Now, putting the lid on will make this actually not quite a complete record player because there's no stylus in it. And let's be honest, it's not a record player until it plays a record. We don't know if it's going to do that until the very end. There was a bit of a debate amongst the crew earlier on about what it was that made this truly portable. Was it the advent of a universal mains plug? Was it that it was compact and then Dan the sound man pointed out that it's because it's got a handle on it. He might have a point. Right, that's the last of those. It's still not quite a record player because it doesn't have a stylus in it and it doesn't have a record on it. We shall sort that out and then it's party time. Don't need my little pot for this bit. What I'm actually taking here is the cartridge. The whole assembly is the cartridge. The stylus is just the little pointy needle bit right in the very end of it. That bit is the cartridge. I'm putting it down on its side so I'm not touching the actual style, styli, styluses. Definitely need my specs for this. And this piece, oh wow, I'd completely forgotten about that. Ours had this. It actually had two different styluses in the cartridge. Like it says 78, because people still had 78s in the olden days. Then you flipped it over for LP because the size of the point of the needle was different because the groove size was different. I'd totally forgotten that. That's taken me right back. The stylus is really a diamond tip. We used to get very excited about it when I was a kid because it says, like it says here in fact, fitted with genuine diamond stylus. And we thought, wow, that's amazing. Must be worth a fortune. But of course, it's a chip of industrial diamond, which is worth very little. This is an exciting moment. There you go. That's all 195 components back together. It looks like a record player. Does it sound like one? Shall we listen to a record? Yes? Over the course of the last 8 hours and 46 minutes, I've seen a collection of disparate components gradually coalesce into something more than the sum of its parts. An enabler of romance, independence and sedition. But that's all nonsense if it won't play a record. And I've got just the record to rekindle the fire of youth in your belly. Right, you're going to like this. This is a real classic. Oh, that's an old familiar feeling. Right, you ready? Yes! Perfect.